Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the session uh, titled as uh, Design Driven Innovation. Uh, design plays an essential role in fostering innovation and brands nowadays, and we see a lot of uh, good example from uh, industries as like Airbnb, Tesla, and Apple. Uh, corporations are very good at using design. And in Japan, design is getting attention as an essential uh, critical resource of business. Uh, for example, startups and corporations are now having, uh, for example, chief design officer on the uh, executive board. Uh, even in government, uh, change is happening. Uh, for example, Mr. Asanuma, uh, he's a, a chief digital officer at the digital ministry, and he's uh, from design background. And today we've got the fantastic lineup of uh, global leaders from industry to education. Uh, they will introduce the latest trends and case studies to discuss about the potential of design. Okay, uh, let's uh, start the conversation with Miles. Uh, Miles is a professor at Tokyo University to uh, set up the cross-culture education uh, among design and engineering. So Miles, uh, can you give, uh, give us the, the definition of design-driven innovation and a snapshot of what are you doing in, uh, uh, at the Tokyo University? Certainly, thank you, Kenya. So, hello, everybody. Yes, my name is Miles Pennington, and um, uh, so design-driven innovation. We we have a design lab at the University of Tokyo that we call design-led innovation, and I think the the core reason for doing that is design is often seen as a kind of finishing process or a backroom activity, whereas we see it very much as the driver for change, creating new ideas, and uh, navigating. Uh, new ways in society and new uh, uses of technology. So my background originally was engineering and I went to uh, uh, study design at master's level. So I've always been interested in mixing disciplines that uh, are very useful for creativity. Uh, I ran a, a, a master's program in London for many years called Innovation Design Engineering, which was to encourage students essentially to become entrepreneurial and use design as, as the driving force for uh, uh, catalyzing new change and starting new businesses. What uh, I'm doing here at the University of Tokyo, I feel is more, is kind of gone uh, into a much more deeper fundamental exploration, is we're interested in exploring the very fundamentals of research, science, technology, and engineering that's happening at the university uh, mixing designers directly with those researchers, researchers to see uh, how we can create value more directly and bring that work uh, more quickly out into society. So it, it's, it has started as an experiment. I think it's quite an unusual place for design to be. It's different from incubation or accelerating uh, centers. And um, yeah, I'd be very glad to, uh, to tell you more about it. But I think fundamentally that's how we see uh, design-driven or design-led innovation is that it's using design to drive innovation. It's not the only way of innovating, but I think the, the processes and approaches of design are incredibly useful for uh, driving new ideas successfully forward. Thank you, Mice. Could you tell me a little bit more about the, what kind of people are gathering in your lab? Yes, certainly. So, so from... Uh, originally, the, the lab started as a collaboration between the Royal College of Art and the University of Tokyo. The thinking being that the RCA, the Royal College of Art, brings um, uh, design and design and creativity, and U Tokyo brings the, the research and technology. So we, that, that's uh, still a core part of what we do, but uh, I hopped over and actually work now for the University of Tokyo. But our mission is still to bring an international mix of people uh, into the lab. Uh, and the reason for that is we want diversity in experience and uh, cultural background and uh, approaches because that difference drives difference in uh, innov innovation and creativity. You know, it's, in it's inescapable that that sort of broad spectrum of different people is really important uh, for new, new ideas. And if you compare the uh design-driven innovation versus uh, tech-driven innovation, how do you see the difference from uh, each other? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, the core part of it is the human element. So um, design 
for me has many benefits, but maybe the, the really core difference is the kind of close connectivity with thinking about people. And whether that's individuals or societies, uh, communities and so on, it's really the, the bigger difference is that uh, quite often in a kind of drive for technological innovation, you know, the, everyone, including me at times, gets excited just purely about the kind of advancements of the technology. Isn't it amazing it does that? But uh, design, I think, is constantly good at reminding us this is ultimately for people, for society, and that is an incredibly important part of the success of it in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. Uh, we are going to come back to you um, again. Hi, Yoki. And, uh, uh, thank you for joining this panel uh, online from the US. Uh, thank you. And uh, first of all, could you uh, tell us about uh, your uh, company, Johanna, and your services? I, I know uh, the, the uh, Johanna has launched in Japan uh, from the uh, Yokohama, I, I would say. Yeah, uh, yeah. Kanagawa Ken. Yeah, yeah, in Kanagawa. Uh, could you tell, tell us about your, uh, what, what is Johanna and uh, what kind of uh, role uh, uh, of design is happening in Johanna community? Sure. Hi, I'm Yoki Matsuoka. I'm uh, calling in from California. Um, so Johanna is a, a full subsidiary of Panasonic. And what we launched as a product in the U.S. first last year and then in Japan on September 13th um, is a uh, what we're calling modern um, family uh, concierge service. So, you, you know, it is a subscription service. Um, you know, anybody can subscribe to become a member and that they will be getting an app with people and AI in the background that assist you with all types of family needs. So that's what we've launched. Um, and we are doing this, of course, as part of Panasonic as and a hope that we can really help build that future of Panasonic, uh, which has an incredible amount of product lineup. So, and, you know, I'm also um, an officer at Panasonic and I'm really trying to transform how things get built and where we go as a company together. So with that, you know, in terms of design, um, I have also a background working for Google and Apple and different places, and I've seen how design was incorporated in a product making and design, a product making design. And, you know, um, the way we built Johanna and the Johanna product was uh, utilizing exactly the same process that we have used at Google and different startups that was created by people from Apple. So, you know, we are... Uh, very much steeped in design thinking. We are very much about driven by pain points of the needs and of the user, studying that to death and then making sure that process is through and through just available and checking that constantly all the way to the end. Then also continue to listen to people after we launch and then improving the product with software updates. So that's who we are. Um, and also we're trying to, you know, make sure that we start to do that a lot more within Panasonic as well. Thank you, Yoki. Uh, when, I, when I had a look at the uh, service des description of Johanna on your website, I was so surprised at the, uh, the insight uh, behind the product. It's, that's fantastic. Uh, could you tell me a little kind of a, a tangible story around how uh, did you get uh, that kind of deep insight? Maybe that was, that was by uh, the design thinking process, but uh, could you t t tell us a bit about, yeah, around that? Sure. I mean, I, I you know, I, I have been, my mission has been uh, building, you know, technology, technological solutions for people who can benefit in improving their everyday life. And, you know, I have started from building devices for people with different kinds of disabilities when I was a professor. And then I've moved on now to building this thing for everyday family. Um, the insights that came into this product has a lot to do with 
you know, of course, really first identifying the target audience, the target audience of those busy families who are out there and then just struggling. And then, of course, this was heightened during pandemic. We have conducted user studies in China, Japan, and the U.S. to understand what those pain points were just really acutely. And as the product matured, we kept asking over and over. Um, but I do have to say that a lot of insights came from myself as well, which is, I think, is an incredibly important part of product design as well. I also have four kids. Um, I have a job and I juggle it all uh, most of the time failing. But because of that, there are pain, pain points that I just know that a lot of families are going through. Um, so the combination of the study um, and um, just, you know, anecdotes for myself, for example, um, I struggle with, you know, dinner, basically like that, you know, every, you know, you probably have all have this problem of kids asking like, what's for dinner tonight? And then you feel extremely frustrated. It's like, oh, well, that I have to worry about that again today. And then just keeps coming. It keeps, it's going to happen tomorrow again. Right. So these are good examples of things that become a cognitive load that we realized in every country that we're trying to solve. Thank you. Okay. It is a uh... The understanding of uh, target user is a uh, core and essential part of design, and uh, you're the, the target user. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, yeah. thank you for waiting, John. Yeah, John is uh, uh, the designer from the future. So, <laughs> John, uh, could you tell a little bit uh, uh, your your insights or your uh, viewpoint of uh, technology disruptive uh, tech? Uh, innovation around creative sector. Uh, we see the the, uh, the big news uh, from AI technology as like uh, stable diffusion. That that is uh, going to be a kind of a, a disruptive innovation for uh, designers and artists, right? So, uh, do you have any insights around uh, how uh, humans and machines are going to be uh, collaborating to each other uh, in in you know AI or tech tech uh, trend? Well, I, I wish I had a good answer to that, can <laughs> you? Um, um, you know, I was just having a dinner last night with someone who is on the Rhode Island School of Design board. He's, uh, when I was there, uh, he, he was a younger alumni, architecture, Hong Kong-based, really, really smart guy. And um, he was telling me that uh, there's this guy his, his name is Tango. His nickname is Tango, Aaron Tang. And Aaron Tang was his plus one. Aaron Tang is like a like a rebel, you know? It's like a, like a fly, flies around things. Sort of, kind of like identifies trends. And he was talking about stable diffusion and large language model AI. And nobody would listen to him. <laughs> he kept going to every person and saying like, this is the future, this is the future. Like, Everyone's like, yeah, 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 you know. So, I mean, it, it's clear that large language model AI is 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 radical. It's going to be transformative. It's already transformative. I think the drawing pictures is just a a minor aspect of what it does. But I've been thinking. I haven't thought about design a lot. So, um, I just looked him up. So John Heskett, he was a historian of industrial design. Uh, John Heskett, and I'm sure if any of you in this group know his name, but he used to be famous. Once you die, no one cares anymore. <laughs> so basically, he was famous at the time. Now he's dead, so we don't know him anymore. But um, I remember him talking, he gave a talk about how there's these, um, so, sort of in, in Tibet, there's something called Tibetan tailors. And he said that the Tibetan tailors show up at someone's house and like live there for a, like a month or more. And they eat what the family eats. They observe the activities that the family is a part of and participates as well. And then uh, eventually creates the clothes that they they create as a barter for being able to eat during that period. And um, it kind of made me think of how the ability to understand context is really a radical thing. And when Yoki brought up pain points, you know, pain points are those sort of local maxima or whatever 
it's almost as if how do you build the entire picture? Um, I think is when design works well. I think that Japanese are inherently good at it because, or the old way of designing things, because they were tied to nature and nature has four seasons. And I think that seasonality was a part of how Japanese used to make things because of the animism part too. So anyways, that's my design thought for now. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, John. Right. Miles, uh, do you have any, any thinking on comments uh, when you know, uh, we have uh, these kind of uh, thoughts? Uh, what's, what occurred to me as uh, the others were talking is that um, I think what we're trying to do at the University of Tokyo is, is, is kind of slightly different. You know, we, uh, uh, I think pain points and kind of insights are really key part of design. You're a very strong kind of driver to find solutions. But it always occurs to me very often when we're doing projects that we can't find those. Because we, in a way, we are starting with technology. You know, we are putting designers face to face with researchers, trying to understand what they're doing at the very forefront of uh, uh, of their research, and trying to figure out how to use it. And it's a slightly backwards process for design, but I think it still has an incredible power. You know, the other day we we were working with a, a lab that's developing. I think called metamaterials, which is a very wide range of uh, science material from chemistry and uh, engineering uh, discipline. But uh, metamaterials have, an, have some amazing abilities to do things, for example, like bend light. Like we could, we could see through that wall if it had a coating of metamaterials, or we could have cameras that are th you know, thin as a piece of paper. It's an incredible thing. But one of the struggles we have is we can kind of continuously create ideas, but there's, you know, we're search, there's no pain point to, to work against, or there's no insight to, to answer. And this is, I think, one of our challenges, and it's a kind of new, new type of designer that needs to explore those questions. Uh, it is sometimes we are challenged, like this is, you know, this is not design. Design, you start with a human need. But I think in terms of the future of business that it's incredibly important to get designers involved in the, evo the evolution of these sciences and technologies because they're going to have such amazing impact. And what that impact is, yeah, I, d I don't know either. But designers, I think, must be part of that conversation, navigating you know, interesting and meaningful directions as we move forward. OK. Uh, as, a, as a part of ed education, I would say maybe a classical type of designers are uh, and a new type, uh, types of designers are slightly different. And uh, maybe educational process is a bit different from each other, right? So what kind of uh, students or people are going to be the, the next archetype? So I think what what's I'm particularly interested in is people from, a, you know, again, a very diverse set of backgrounds. You know, I think uh, actually, you know, design education is brilliant at, uh, at creating strong designers these days in the classic sense of you know the you know they can follow a great process and create amazing products and services what i've always been interested in is the yeah the new evolution of that type of person so for me it's as interesting to have someone from an art or a business or a, or a technology background joining to be a designer and we consider them the designers as soon as they walk in the door they may not be able to draw or they may not have a sharp kind of insight gathering ability or to be able to prototype but there those differences of opinions will bring new ideas to the table and I think that for me is incredibly important in my educational I've not always been in education I started in 2008 but it has always been about bringing new people into design not making designers better I think in a way we I sometimes think of design as a, as a tool and, you know, and, and there are amazing designers who could join and bring those skills. But what I'm interested in, in is other people's vision, like vision making as a part of design is I find incredibly exciting. Yeah, at the Tokyo University is uh, right now, I, uh, I see that quite many engineering students are looking at design uh, literacy or uh, thinking as a tool to, to enhance their engineering ability, right? Certainly, I, I think yeah, University of Tokyo is a, is a great institution. It's it doesn't have a long history in kind of cre creative fields. There are some very 
there's some amazing academics and professors who run some amazingly creative labs, but it doesn't have a core heart of uh, a design or an innovation focused uh, discipline yet. Uh, but I think, you know, because it's surrounded by all these uh, amazing other disciplines, it's a great place uh, to start something. Yeah, not succeeded yet, but uh, that really was the mission for me is to kind of replicate uh, a design focused innovation course to uh, encourage new generation of, of students to go in a different way here in Japan. Thank you. Yoki, uh, could you tell me a little bit about your team? Uh, what kind of designers are uh, working in your team or maybe hybrid type like a semi engineer and semi designer uh, probably uh, included within your team. But the, could you tell me uh, about the, what kind of designers are working on Johanna product? Sure, yeah. I, I First of all, I can tell you that I'm not a designer. <laughs> I'm surrounded by designer in this panel. So I will probably be coming from the, you know, different perspective. Um, however, yes, yeah, so design types, I'll just sort of say a little more, you know, uh, generic types of designers that tend to work in an organization like ours as well. But there are typically, you know, researchers like UXR researchers who, you know, need to really understand how to do just like what we're talking about, user needs and then, you know, be nimble and then how to do interviews with people um, and run studies. And we also have, of course, the sort of the traditional designers who probably have all kinds of backgrounds. And I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what kind of backgrounds they have, whether they came from engineering or, you know, art or all of that. But most of these folks come with incredible portfolios. Um, and then the, you know, the important part is also the UXE, UX engineers. Um, they're the ones who can actually prototype all kinds of different things to really make be that connective tissue and deciding, you know, how, like, oh, this is not going to work. No, no, let me, this idea is hard to visualize. Can we quickly build it and then, you know, let people visualize it so that we can make a decision of what to do for design? Um, so, you know, with, there are definitely a mix of those folks. Um, I would have to say also our design, you know, thinking or, that, you know, just having design is a centroid is everywhere. So our product managers have to be able to think like designers and our designer, our engineers also often think a lot like designers. So that is the, you know, the important, you know, I think John used the word of end to end, but in order for us also to have the process of end to end, uh, we have to make sure that we are able to have that through everywhere in the organization. So you said that uh, design, uh, Miles told us uh, design is uh, a tool, kind of shared tool, and uh, uh, even even for product manager or uh, engineers should learn about uh, what design can, can do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, we are, I mean, we're in the U.S. where we're highly, you know, expert driven. So, of course, we hire people who are very, very good at what they do, the world's best at what that thing is, we don't hire generalists. So, you know, it's not that if we ask any engineers, do you know how to do the design? The very likely the answer is no. And I want it to be no, so that they are very, very deep in engineering. However, that as you, you know, you, you guys are using the word design thinking, we have to be um, design minded, we have to be user minded. And, you know, design in many ways is a word to go with, you know, for consumer products is it's a user thinking. It's almost, you know, replaceable sometimes just that it has to be beautiful for people. It has to be extremely usable for people. And then it has to be that thing that they cannot live without. Um, so that lives through the entire organization. Thank you. Thank you, Yoki. John, uh, do you have any comments on thoughts uh, from, from this session? Maybe you have... Uh, well... I'm kind of stuck because, um, you know, I think that Dr. Matsuoka is one of the world's greatest designers of defining what design is really now, which is much more complex than it was in the past. And I think that's important to note because I was just thinking about how, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you can try to teach quote unquote interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary design in universities or blah, 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 blah. You can try this, whatever, whatever. But um, I think there's a fundamental disconnect in society between those who can make something and those who cannot. And I think that 
you know, I was just looking online to look at the statistics national for the United States. Um, 20% of majors, uh, undergrads are business. They can't make anything. Um, add on 15% more are liberal arts. They can't make anything. Um, but they usually are in charge or in, in power roles, organizational roles uh, in an organization. So I think that the reason why design kind of became relevant in large organizations is that the, the group mind of non-makers was so strong that new things were not being made. Um, and that's a problem. If you rewind Japan's history, um, you know, when Dr. Matsuka mentioned uh, Panasonic, I thought about how, like, um, I remember the, I liked it. For a time, there was this joke that Sony was the research lab for Matsushita because they would, they would make a radical product. It break down, like Tesla almost, right? They'd make a product that kind of broke down, but it was really cool. And then Matsushita would make the, the model that everyone could have, right? Um, but that is the Sony and Matsushita in a post-World War II era where they had lost and they had to come back. And they wanted their families to be prosperous. And so it's an era where, you know, maybe the business people or liberal arts people are actually much more makery. They want to make something. And the engineering capability was so high because you know, the, the, the way that the Chinese character systems, the ultra complexity of it makes that kind of mind more apt for doing very highly detailed things or extremely simple things. I love how they, um, when I used to know um, Tanaka Iko Sensei, I loved how his name, you know, Tanaka One Light, it was the most simple kanji. And that's why he was the greatest designer <laughs> because he had grown up with the perfect name. Um, and, uh, so I, I guess along with saying that, um, statistics determine a lot. So if the world is linear, the nonlinear people are always going to be losing and they need to make friends. And so I would argue that, um, I think engineers and design people talk well enough to each other. Uh, I think the greater problem is the, the business people, the political people. I think that communication skill is a, is a rare skill that I think more universities should actively invest in. Thank you, John. Mars, do you have, do you have any thoughts? Uh, so I, I, was, I was going to, uh, again, you know, contemplating that I sit here in the, in the field of education, which is sort of different. I'm not trying to make a company stronger in a, in a sense, so, you know, in the way looking, trying to create a new generation that's thinking slightly different. Uh, and I yeah, really like uh, John's point about makers and, and non-makers, but I, but I think actually, I suppose I'm privileged that I sit at, you know, masters and higher level, and a lot of, you know, education is about, uh, of course, school and, and undergraduate, where, yeah, we are, we, we have a very rigid system, and it, I don't believe it works very well. It puts people in certain channels, and by the time they reach an age when they really know or are excited about doing something, they're often stuck in a particular channel, and that doesn't help. And I think one of the things that needs to be radically innovated is actually education itself. We need a different model that, that can break down these barriers so we don't have uh, this problem you know, about makers and non-makers. It's like it would be much more, uh, uh, we need a much more fluid uh, way of working across uh, the, uh, and changing people. But I think, uh, uh, to to think about it is like yeah we we've uh, you know I've been involved at uh, graduate level education and actually seen many you know people make that leap themselves so amazing philosopher from a couple of years ago joined our course and the his way of thinking brought so much you know new direction to to projects and yes he couldn't actually physically make anything on day one but we were lucky we know we have two years to get people to learn new skills and. And some of it is, of course, learning a skill like electronics or drawing or something. And that is important so people can communicate and prototype. But their fundal the fundamental way of thinking isn't going to change. And that is somehow uh, you know, the brilliant aspect of uh, education. So I think, yes, uh, maybe my reflection on the conversation so far is, yes, I, 
I think the strongest point which we often think about is we need to radically rethink the way that we teach, right down to you know young children. Um, and I think the one last point for me is we ran, you know, often uh, at, when people are older, one of our biggest efforts in relearning is to be creative. And we recently ran a high school uh, workshop in the summer. And we have lots of tricks to make people creative because we're usually working with 20 plus, 30 plus people. Uh, and we were halfway through these exercises when we realized we do not need any of these tricks. These people are obviously, you know, their, their creativity has not been blocked yet. And it was a completely different learning and teaching experience. So, yeah, I think yeah, we need to get back into those roots and allow people to grow up and be educated in new ways that helps uh, businesses and startups and society in general. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we we dig, dig, dig into the, the kind of uh, uh, case studies in uh, uh, early stage of education. But, uh, Yuki, uh, uh, it's a different viewpoint, but the in when when we look at the uh, corporate transition at uh, Panasonic, uh, we've seen that uh, Mr. Uh, Usui uh, he is assigned as the first uh, design chief design officer at Panasonic, right? And uh, uh, the president Kusumi uh, Kusumi San is uh, he's quite keen on uh, design and design thinking. Could you tell me a little bit about the how Panasonic is going to be changed? Uh, in a corporate culture or uh, process of uh, product planning and uh, services? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, I, I think also um, Dr. Maida san said the similar thing about Japan is actually quite good with design, but at the same time, it's having often like when you look at the product, sometimes you wonder where that design thinking they're so good at has gone into, right? So I would say, um, Panasonic absolutely wants to get to a point where every product reflects their incredible talent and the design ability. Um, and you know, I, having uh, Mr. Utsu, Usui um, at the helm of that design in a company is a statement to say that it's very important for Panasonic. Um, also, Panasonic, as they have invested in us, Johanna, the software company in many ways and services, that design thinking for a company like Panasonic must expand from amazing hardware design to software design, service design, you know, much wider way of thinking about what design is about. So that's something that I am helping to bring in. Um, one of the examples that Panasonic has really initiated and, and I'm supporting in a significant way is a um, almost an exposure program or exchange, almost like exchange employee program where we, Johanna, in the U.S., in Silicon Valley, have used a process of design thinking to build our product. Now, this is something that many of the Panasonic people have not seen. So what we do is that we almost have a rotation program where people come to the US, sit at Johanna, any length between two weeks to years to really experience different part of how we build a product with design thinking. So we could say, hey, that might be really slow. No, I don't think so. I think this is an, you know, one way of really uh, re-innovating a company. And one thing that we know that Panasonic is good at, um, as Dr. Maida said, is looking at how other people have done it and then incorporating it and making it so much better in a mass production sense. So if we can show the way that we do things at Silicon Valley, and that can be embodied in them, the designers and the engineers and the product thinkers, and even people who are in the manufacturing floor, all those people can then understand that and then become the missionaries to a certain extent to the company and then transform the company. So uh, I am very impressed with Panasonic's investment in design moving forward and the commitment to make sure that that goes into people and that goes into the process. Yeah, it is. It is great to see that you know kind of uh, things happening in the large scale corporation uh, in Japan, 
and Johanna is a kind of a, a example for for the whole corporation to understand what what can happen in in corporation. That's that's great story. John, do you have any any re reflection on comment uh, from from this conversation? Oh my gosh, so many, <laughs> <laughs> so many things. <laughs> uh, so many. After I was taking notes, uh, 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 so um, well, the first thing was on um, you know just uh, higher education or education in general. You know, at at MIT, I was uh, on the uh, curriculum, so whatever. The uh, MIT has a meeting where they meet every 10 years for three years. It's the big committee at MIT where they research MIT's curriculum vigorously. And then they come to the same conclusion every 10 years that MIT's curriculum is awesome. <laughs> and so I remember that. So I was on this special Jedi committee and I'll never forget, you know, the thing about, it's the thing about, you know, study your users. You know, uh, there were two there were two students on this committee, and um, we were talking about uh, freshman advising. And it used to be that MIT would require all uh, professors to advise freshmen. When I went to MIT, that was the way. Okay, very good. Okay, so MIT over time had gotten lazy, so uh, professors got lazy. So MIT changed the policy so that. Um, professional academic advisors, professional career advisors would advise the freshmen instead of professors. And so we're on this committee and, you know, we're all the Jedi and we're like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. That is horrible. You know, we should advise the freshmen. That is the way it should be. And then um, the students got up at the table. Uh, one of them said to us, she, she looked at all of us and said, what do you mean you'll help us with our future careers? You all don't have real jobs. And I remember that. And it was like a light forming in the sky for me. Because if you were in computer science in the 90s, um, academia was still slightly ahead of industry. But after the year 2000, I mean, like so long, you know, everyone. So I wanted to note that something has happened. Something has changed where the difference is so great that um, industry's advantage is just uh, incalculably further ahead than academia thinks or imagines. Second thing is uh, about design and Matsushita. And I was thinking about Sony again, because I remember that I, because uh, I, I used to work with Sony and um, I remembered Sony had this uh, micro cassette um, recorder that was the, almost the same size as a micro cassette. Some of you may not know what a micro cassette is, but it's, but it's very tiny. And the, the body was only slightly larger than the micro cassette. And then I, I, I got to meet the guy. He was like 80 something years old, like, ah, oh, uh, Nantoka san. He's the guy, the Tatsujin that made this thing. And um, I'm thinking back to how, like, um, there was a time when Japan was able to excel in design based upon mini miniaturization. It's almost as if, as, it's, like, it's like the cloud today. It's like a big hack that no one else can do. And Japan can miniaturize like nobody. Uh, the second thing, going back to the Matsushita example, uh, someone could make it really reliable. <laughs> and I think that combination of miniaturization and, re and reliability was a new user aspect of technology that nobody had mastered outside of the Japanese electronics companies. And I think of that as, an, as a great example, you know, Kenya, about your point about design and engineering. It isn't about design-led or engineering-led. It's there's a paradigm shift that occurs where a certain kind of engineering technology has human value that design and business can exploit. So that's all. Thank you, John. Wow, great comment. Thank you. Uh, Miles, uh, maybe this is going to be the final uh, question for you, but the, uh, we see the human factor is going to be the kind of shared core value uh, around design, right? And our community. But uh, uh, when we look at the, the reality of the society, uh, we have uh, UX 
here, but uh, we have sustainability or uh, survival issues around human race, right? So uh, design could contribute to that kind of aspect, more kind of a global issue or... Yes, I think, I think uh, well, I suppose from an educationalist perspective, what's exciting about design or utilising design in education is the trajectory that it's been on in the last 40, 40 years. You know, 40 years ago, it was really about, you know, making things, you know, sketching a new power drill, being able to model it, and f make a physical model and paint it up. You know, it was about kind of very, very product-focused uh, type of activity, a kind of craft in a way, and uh, and I think as design education has evolved and design itself has evolved, of course it has become very much more complex. And for me, the and now we have you know service design and kind of experience design and much more kind of it's drifted into and focused on more intangible aspects, which I think is very important. The 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 next step for me for uh, that kind of uh, progress is for the for designers and i think this is where we're really stretching the definition of design it's already a very you know elastic word that covers far too many things it should probably be one you know there should be 50 words that actually mean design so we can have much more resolution what is what you are talking about but what i what i think is the next uh, generation of educationalist task is to move it into uh, high level of kind of policy making where it can have absolutely the highest level of influence on on societies you know it's helping to make the policies that we live under and that could be uh, influencing business and also the environment and everything else to do with the way that we live uh, and I think this is you know there are there are uh, policy labs around the world and people are interested in this so I think it is starting to happen but I think the same kind of tools of you you know uh, being uh, imaginative and being unafraid of failure and creating ideas and trying them uh, in that way of design that design is so good at and always keeping people and society at the center of what you're doing uh, are very useful and I think the the future we will we will see people creating uh, policy that we won't recognize as designers and I think there are many people in design now that you know they don't label themselves designers and we don't label themselves design or maybe some people do some people don't it's like it doesn't matter at the end of the day uh, I think we can cast aside the worry about the definition of what the word means and think how this uh, amazing process can actually influence the way that uh, countries and the nations are built and I think that will have that's what we need right now for the emergencies around climate change and there are many societal challenges that need that approach so Thank you, Miles. Uh, before getting into Q&A session, Yoki, uh, could you give us uh, an, an, an advice to uh, our audience how we have uh, many uh, corporate senior executives here, so uh, what kind of uh, learning or what kind of uh, literacy uh, should the corporate executive learn about uh, on, on design, about design? Mm -hmm. So, in this panel, I'm probably the furthest away from design literacy. So um, that might be a question for the others. I don't get people to read anything. I just immerse them into the actual product design process itself. They need to learn it with their body and their, you know, everyday, I guess, everyday struggle in how difficult it actually is and how different it actually also is from what they learn in school and what they read about. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty far from that, but from, you know, in terms of the corporate execs who are wanting to do design reform, um, I'm really happy with what we're trying to do, which is to really the exposure of how to do it. It's a very different way of looking at it. As a matter of fact, actually there's something interesting that happened at Johanna. Um, so we shipped our Johanna service and membership in the US first. Then Panasonic folks, including designers, got to watch how that was made and then watched how that was used by users and what the responses were. Then we said, okay, it's time to make one for Japan. That service design thinking in Japan suddenly came to life. You know, in Japan, how 
um, the service is amazing, actually. It coming, you know, from the U.S. to Japan, the fact that there these days maybe not as much, but the fact that there are people like the gas station. There's so many people at the gas station. So helpful. The, in the elevator, there are people who just are just being helpful, right? On the street, there's so many people are just being helpful. And then I guess that you know these days there's people shortage, so those things are going away a little bit. But the culture lives on in a country, and I felt like we ignited that within Panasonic and at Yohana Japan to be able to build that into the product that we built and shipped in Japan. So Yohana Japan product um, in many ways is better than the one that we shipped in the US because they were able to think differently. They were really listening to people that, you know, um, it's, I think that's you know, miniaturization Japanese people are really good at this. And then again, making it almost better and then, you know, mass production and all of that is better. But I'm extremely hopeful as well that I think there's something to the service design that can really ignite as well. And happy to talk to many of you as well in terms of how we can make that possible in many of the corporate structures in Japan as well. Thank you. Okay, great advice. Okay, uh, let me open the floor up. Uh, now, uh, please give us your any comments and uh, thoughts or questions, and please raise your hand uh, and identify yourself, and uh, please make your question concise. Okay. Uh, all right. Great. We have one, two, three, four, five. All right. Okay. Please. Thanks. Uh, my name is Darren Manabney. I'm a lecturer here at Globus and actually teach design thinking. So I have a question for John. John mentioned the challenge that many business people and makers don't communicate well. Why does he think that is? What are the particular communication barriers and what can we do to overcome those barriers? All right. I, I, I am going to collect all that question first. All right. Please. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Yoshiki Takashi. I'm leading... Uh, SAP customer experience ecosystem in Japan and Korea. So I'm supporting a lot of uh, corporate uh, digital transformation with uh, uh, design thinking. So most of everyone understand the importance of design thinking. On the other hand, the reality, it's very difficult to break down the legacy system. So the, could you please give us a hint what is the count over gets to the transformation to be the ideal situation. Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm Abigail Friedman. I was just um, the moderator for the women's empowerment uh, panel that came before. Um, and I have a question for Miles because as an educator and uh, your focus on diversity, um, do you, what are your thoughts on how to expand uh, diversities, particularly uh, women in the field of design and engineering? What are you seeing at Todai? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you. All right, next. Thank you. I'm Daniel Moraro. I've just graduated, actually, MBA here at Globis, and also I'm a professor at Shizuoka University. So uh, I would like to ask, actually, thank everyone for the good insights, but maybe ask Miles about the importance of design into the fundamental research. So you mentioned the design as a, a bridge between researchers and products, and everybody gave excellent examples of how this happens. But fundamental research, the research that is curiosity-driven, and not necessarily product-driven. How do you see that impact in communicating these results to society? Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. Hi, uh, my name is Yusuke Matsuda. I'm country manager for Crimson Global Academy, uh, international um, online high school here in Japan. Uh, Miles, it was very interesting that you mentioned that it's very hard to teach design thinking creativity for adults, but easier for children. Um, but uh, on the other hand, it's very hard to transform the whole education system to foster design thinking creativity. Do you guys all any have any um, tips that we can do in a daily life to teach design thinking or creativity to our kids, maybe in a daily practice and raising our, our children? Okay, thank you. 
All right. First of all, Miles, uh, you've got three questions, diversity and fundamental research and the final one. So, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll try and be quick. So, um, diversity first. So, yeah, this uh, has always been a challenge. I've always been involved in a kind of more engineering side of design. Uh, and I think when, well, actually, I studied that kind of course. So, yeah, many years ago, it was m hugely male dominated. And it went about f 15 or 20 years ago, I think, with the introduction of more uh, efforts from the UK government to spread out, uh, to encourage women to join engineering courses. We gradually saw a turnaround. We put a lot of effort into, you know, changing the voice that we communicated with. Uh, and that had a real difference. And uh, in the space of five years, we actually managed to get uh, at least uh, male-female gender balance 50-50, which for us was a great result. And that then snowballed. It just continued. You're like, we didn't need to put so much effort in. It felt like we had to... The big part was the communication to the outer world. I think everyone, you know, if you're interested in it, then, uh, you know, we need to break down the, some of the kind of yeah, male-dominated messages that have been associated with engineering. You, Tokyo, very... Uh, we have the, the same challenge. It is a male-dominated university, uh, and the university is working on that. You know, diversity is a big part of the strategy now. Our job is to be, you know, a diverse international group, and that isn't to be, you know, a very, you know, aware that we don't want to be in our own bubble. We must be an influencing international group. Hence, every single thing we do is in collaboration. So we don't shut ourselves in a room and just work on nice ideas. We have to get out and influence the other people around us by uh, working with them. So that's, you know, that's our mission. We're still very small scale. Uh, and But for me, diversity is one of the key drivers to making... Uh, interesting ideas and a really fun working environment. Um, so, yeah, I'm a major yeah, advocate for that. Which comes on to the second gentleman's question, sorry, the, the gentleman's question about um, yeah, bringing value to research. And, yeah, for fundamentally, I think designers and scientists have a kind of similar similar way of working, but obviously, very, and in some respects, very different. You know, very both are very curious. But... Um, we, it's not just about product creation. What we found is we bring value by, yes, yeah, sometimes we can extract research into a product idea. Sometimes it's about um, showing them the future of their work. So some research is so fundamental. You know, every day's job is about growing a cell in the lab. But they can't see how a society will benefit it in 10, 20 years. Our job is to illustrate that with real prototype simulations and so on. And the third value is bringing the public closer. I think there's a gap between university and society, and closing that is important for us. Which brings us on to your question of like, yeah, how do we then bring you know design out into the and um, into the general public? I don't have a cl very clever answer for that one. I think it you know it's such a fundamental challenge. It's like uh, you know how to change the way that we bring up. Uh, and educate our school children right across the world. I don't, th you know, it's 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 at different levels in different places. In the UK now, they're dragging money out of design, you know, education, which is a shame. Uh, I think I know just encouraging uh, children always to to make and to f be fearless about the future that they can shape it. They don't have to fall into you know a particular way of working. So. Constantly bringing them to design class and making that part of their education until education sorts it out. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. Yoki, uh, could you get second question? Uh, the gentleman uh, asked us about the uh, hint for uh, cooperation transition by using design, design thinking. Sure. So I think, you know, um, uh, I, I, wrote down through two things. One is around visualization. So I think that in, you know, I don't know if this is global in Japan, both, but often people are able to design things a little bit better the moment they can visualize something, right? So it would be very critical to either have something that, um, you know, they can look at and go like, oh, I understand, or hire somebody who can create that thing. So prototype, just to show that concept so that in Japanese, there's the word mieruka. Um, there is a, you know, ability to do that is so, so important. 
Um, so I just wanted to mention that. But the second part is the actual process change. We can't just tack on design or hire a giant team of designers or hire an agency and says, okay, now we should be able to move forward. It is not true. So I would, you know, highly recommend that full process, which is, you know, the often hard to do given that, you know, that a lot of the corporations, you know, as you said, have already started in and have the legacy that they're living with. So every company will probably do this differently. Some companies probably can actually say clean slate, start, you know, we're now we're going to use a new process. Many companies can't do that. And then we have to do a little bit at a time, but in order to even do it a little bit at a time or cleaning wise, we have to have enough people who understand it really well and feel the urgency to change it. Um, you know, I think the reason for having the legacy sometimes is also that, you know, there's a belief that it's hard to understand or that the previously working thing should not be destroyed. So you have to even work all the way from there. Thank you, Yoki. John, uh, can you take the first question, communication around make and non -maker? Um Well, um, I was stuck on the SAP person's question about digital transformation, and I have, an, I have something important to tell that person because it took me three years to figure this out, and maybe it's useful. It's the following. So there's this uh, person named Jeannie Ross. She just retired. She was known as a CIO whisperer at MIT Sloan School of Business. And um, Jeannie has this like idea that I do not really understand, and it's too simple, but I find it so useful that I think it's actually so powerful. It's the fact that there's two kinds of digital transformations. One is digitizing, taking something analog and making it digital. And the other is digitalizing, taking an entirely built from the ground up digital model that produces business. An example of digitizing is taking something based on paper, like in a binder and moving it to the cloud. Digitalizing is if I'm like Marriott, a hotel chain, and I wanna take on Airbnb. So I'll stand up an entirely new uh, platform to be able to compete against Airbnb. That's like, that is digitalizing. I think that large organizations are, are, are having a hard time just digitizing. Um, and the CEO wants to digitalize, but they haven't even finished digitizing. So I think that's why uh, design thinking or whatever, it gets stuck in one of two modes. One mode is digitizing, transferring analog to digital. And the other is new business ideas. You have to separate the two. Otherwise, it isn't very useful to design think with anybody because it's unrealistic. Um, what was the question though? I forget. <laughs> Anyways, I think I'm done. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Uh, the question is about the how uh, we can enhance the communication around uh, maker and non -make, non maker community. Oh, well. Um, well, I, I think just, just think about the numbers. Like there's just fewer makers. And I think makers have so much pride and so much belief in their witchcraft or wizardcraft that um, it doesn't let them see things. Uh, I love uh, Dr. Matsuka's, you know, Miruka. It's like she's deploying this thing at scale. She's pushing it through UXR to UXE, testing it, at the scale that it can happen. She's testing a COVID vaccine so everyone can see how many people died, basically, how many people live. I think that is the whole difference. And the problem with the design discipline, quote unquote, is it hasn't evolved to understand that the old model is no longer valid. That's all. Thank you, John. Wow, we run up our time and uh, we, we've got so many keywords uh, here in this session, listening, caring, and visualizing, illustrating, prototyping and testing and sharing maybe. And uh, uh, now we understand that the value of design is going to be shared in uh, all, all the community not, that is not only captured by designers. And uh, thank you very much for coming to this uh, session. And uh, appreciate for, for the great panelists. Please give a, 
uh, big hand to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>